Survivorship Series, hosted by the MIU Men's Health Foundation. I'm Dr. Michael Lutz, and I am the president of the MIU Men's Health Foundation. And tonight, we're going to be talking to two very special guests, and it's about being your healthiest self. One of the things that we'd like to do is we'd like to see how we can improve the health and well-being of all of our prostate cancer survivors and their families, and I think that you'll learn quite a bit during tonight's event. A little bit about our foundation. This year in 2024, we want to talk a little bit about sharing your story and saving a life. That is actually one of the things that we'd like to do this year with all of our prostate cancer survivors and our prostate cancer care and community. So we're hoping that men will actually join us uh, this year and sharing their story and perhaps their story will save somebody else's life. We learned very difficultly this year through other people who've actually been diagnosed with prostate cancer and decided that they weren't comfortable sharing their story, whether it be personal reasons or otherwise. And we know that their story could have changed and saved somebody else's life. So we'd like to take advantage of all of the plethora of people that we've known and taken care of and been part of through all these years and have them help us help others by sharing their story and perhaps their story will save somebody's life. This year we have all of our events in planning and we hope that you'll take a moment to join us. June is International Men's Health Month and we'll be kicking that off during International Men's Health Week, which will be Monday, June 10th with Blue Monday Men's Health, where we'll start sharing many of those stories that'll be sent to us so we can actually start saving lives starting during International Men's Health Week. That evening will be our Cogs and Kegs event, which will be held this year at Griffin Claw, and we're very excited about holding that event this year. On Thursday of the week, we'll have our Mulligans for Men, which is our Top Golf Gala on June 13th, and we hope you'll take a moment out to join us. And on Sunday will be our annual Run for the Ribbon, a prostate cancer run for prostate cancer survivors and their families to come support each other on Father's Day, June 16th at the Detroit Zoo. Our men's health event will be coming up in the fall. We don't have the exact date for it yet because we're waiting for the Detroit Lions to release their schedule. And once they do, we'll release our schedule. And mm -hmm. so that's what we're hoping for and looking forward to. In the meanwhile, if you'd like to take advantage of some of the services we have available through our foundation, we have the men's health checklist, as well as the Blue Fund, which is for prostate cancer survivors who need personal financial support once diagnosed with prostate cancer and they qualify for the necessary needs for their personal finances. We'd like to thank and recognize our sponsors and partners, that being Lantheus, Dendrion, Blue Earth Diagnostics, Neil King Physical Therapy, and of course, the American Cancer Society. And tonight, I'd like to take a moment and introduce our panelists. I'd like to start with Jeffrey Adams. Uh, Jeff is a certified National Academy of Sports Medicine personal trainer, and I think he'll tell us a little bit about what it takes to become an NASM or a, a, a National Academy of Sports Medicine certified personal trainer. He went to the University of Kentucky, and uh, despite being a personal trainer, he actually majored in communications, and I think we'll be able to see why that is when we get to hear his thoughts and his uh, communications. Uh, he's also a track and field athlete, and I want to know what sport he was uh, majored in. And he also founded Hustle with Heart uh, with his husband, Ernest, and we look forward to sharing that information with everybody tonight. Uh, Bruce Milray is with us, and he's a 13-year and counting prostate cancer survivor. Uh, he's a plant-based advocate, a holistic nutritional counselor, and he founded One Day to Wellness, and he author also authored A Plant-Powered Approach to Prostate Cancer, uh, as well as with his wife, who also uh, uh, authored a book called A Plant-Powered Penis, which is probably something we'll uh, have a conversation about as well. And uh, at this point, I'd actually like to start our conversation. I'd like to start with Bruce, uh, because we want to stay with our theme of uh, sharing your story to save a life. So I'd like to take a, have you take a moment with us and, and share with us your prostate cancer journey uh, from how you were diagnosed uh, to where you are today. Thank you, Dr. Lutz. Pleasure being here with you and Jeff. And my prostate cancer story started 13 years ago. Um, I just went in to get um, a regular checkup. And as part of that, my general practitioner had me do my blood work and he included PSA on there. And uh, my PSA came in, I think it was about 6.2. And he said, that's high. And I'm like, I didn't even know what PSA was. I was 52 years old. And... Um, had a biopsy, the biopsy came back positive, 
like I think it was more than 60% of the cores. And so they laid out the different options for me. And along the way, what I will say, what I want the message I'd love to get across is take your time making decisions, medical decisions. Uh, I was so blindsided by my prostate cancer diet. I was having a great life and it just blindsided me. And it really made it difficult for me to make good rational decisions when I really needed to be able to do that. But I was diagnosed and I elected to do, uh, I had elected to get a radical prostatectomy. I had my prostate removed and it turned out the cancer was in about 80% of my prostate cancer. Uh, there was a positive margin in addition to the surgery and I had uh, some minor seminal vesicle invasion. So not really a good profile to get started with there. And when you have the surgery, as you know, Dr. Lutz, your, you sh your PSA should go to zero because if you got all the cancer, there's nothing, and you don't have a prostate, there's nothing there to create PSA. And my PSA never went down below about 0 0.06. And from there, it started to climb back up again. Um, as a result, I had um, uh, adjuvant radiation to my prostate bed. And then about a year and a half after that, that didn't fix the problem. Uh, about a year and a half after that, I had uh, radiation to the lymph node, my, my abdominal lymph nodes, because my team thought that that's probably where the cancer was residing. And the bottom line is I'm still living with prostate cancer today. And I have been on... I'm going to start again in probably about a month. Uh, I'm on intermittent hormone therapy. I've been on several different hormone therapy drugs. And there's really, uh, medically, uh, there's not a whole lot left I can do. Uh, I, I can do more surgery, more radiation, but with probably some pretty severe consequences and risk associated with that. So I've been living with prostate cancer for 13 years. Well, you've definitely had one of the more complicated journeys, and I'm certain that there's people right now who are uh, watching and have had similar courses. Dur during this period of time, did you ever have a PSMA PET scan? I have had three PSMA PET scans. I had one uh, at Stanford, which is where my medical team is currently in Palo Alto, California, um, three weeks ago. And my PSA, it basically showed uh, the tumor still in my prostate bed. Uh, the Gleason score, I actually had, uh, uh, after my very first PSMA scan, I had an additional biopsy where they determined that the Gleason score, my original Gleason score was a three plus four equals seven, and then and it jumped to 4.4, .4, uh, which equals eight now, which indicates more aggressive cancer. So again, not a good prognosticator. Um, and then, but yes, that's how we identify where the cancer was using the PSMA scan. Well, there's no question that uh, because of your challenging course, it's probably made you even become more of a stalwart thinking about the role of your diet, nutrition, and lifestyle. And I, I give you credit for being such a leader in this category. And I think that it's really important that we all take a few moments to listen to you because I think your opinions will have significant validity because here you are looking pretty damn awesome today. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's I feel great. I mean, I exercise a lot. My wife and I are both big physical fitness. I'm, I love to surf. I'm a surfer. I have never felt anything pain or anything associated with really any of my treatments and and not with the cancer. It's all been mental. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. biggest challenge has been my mental challenge. Yeah. And, and we're, it, when did you start be, uh, being on a plant-based diet? Well, I started about six months before I was diagnosed with prostate cancer because uh, my same GP said your cholesterol is high it's at 276 i weighed about 40 40 pounds more than i do right now and i was eating the standard american diet which was meat i love meat love eggs love dairy ate it my whole life and um he said well you're gonna have to go on um statins for the rest of your life because it's in your family at the same time i was flying across the country with my wife and she happened to have the book the china study by dr t colin campbell I don't know if you're familiar with, he's sort of the father of evidence-based, plant-based nutrition. And the, the bottom line is he summarized through really um, elegant research and a lot of research avenues that you don't have to take statins in order to lower your cholesterol. You can just change your diet. So 
13, about the same, uh, 14 years ago, I dove into a plant-based diet and because of my uh, blood work and within six weeks, I went and had it done again and my cholesterol dropped by a hundred points. My triglycerides had come down to exactly where they needed to be. My blood pressure was perfect. And I was feeling, fant- you know, I was starting to lose weight and feeling fantastic. And from that point on, I've just been a real advocate for trying to help everyone, anyone who wants to know, understand the importance of plant-based nutrition. It's a very powerful tool. Yeah, you look great. Well, keep it up. We'll be talking more about that. Uh, Jeff, I'd like to include you in the conversation. Um, as I mentioned before, you graduated with a degree in communications, kind mm-hmm. of a little bit different than what you do now, but it's uh, pretty cool that you did that. And your mission is now a personal trainer. So what pushed you in the direction of becoming a personal trainer? Well, I actually, in, in a way, I kind of stumbled into it. Um, so I was working at uh, a front desk uh, of a big gym in New York City um, part time. So I was in the hospitality world. So I enjoyed customer service. Uh, I had been in retail prior to. So working at the front desk, I actually was exposed to just kind of taking care of people that were coming in to work on their fitness journey. Uh, and actually, the personal training manager there had asked me if I had considered um, becoming a, a personal trainer. And I said, no, I, I never studied kinesiology. I, you know, I was just there for honestly the free gym membership. You know, that was, that was the perk. If you were an employee, you got to work out for free. So having a part-time gig doing what I enjoy, which was customer service, I was able to work out for free and, you know, he saw something in me. And then I started to think about, well, maybe I could. So I started to do a little more research. Um, I ended up finding a tutor who then later became what I call my fitness mentor now. Um, and I kind of went into that direction. I took a chance on faith and somebody saw something in me and, you know, I went for it. And um, that's how I kind of transitioned out of that hospitality retail life and uh, turned it into my my fitness professional career now. That's great. And uh, you, you, there was a, in your notes said something about track and field in college. What was your sport? So uh, my event was the uh, the 400 hurdles. Who? So High was- hurdles? Well, I did both. So yeah, I did the like the 110 meter and the uh, the 60 meter indoors, which are about 42 inches. Um, and then in the outdoor season, the 400 meter hurdles, those were at um, 39 inches. Wow. So, so, so pretty high uh, with, with uh, a 400 meter run and 10 obstacles in between. Um, so yeah, so I got a track and field scholarship. So that took me to uh, the University of Kentucky. And um, yeah, I got to go back into my athletic roots more now in my my fitness journey, much more than I was, you know, in retail and hospitality. So I'm getting getting able to tap into that a little bit more now. So I I, I so I know you're a certified personal trainer, and it, it takes a lot. And you know, I've looked into it to become a certified uh, trainer is is not easy. It's a it's a it's a long course. Um, what circumstances led you to learning more about fitness during cancer treatment? I would say the first would be my husband my partner, uh, in addition to being a great man, uh, he's a two-time cancer survivor. Um, and meeting him, getting to know him, meeting his friends, uh, I've grown to have a good friendship with one of his dear friends, uh, Johnny, who is also a uh, prostate cancer survivor. Um, so really just people, as you just are out in the world and you're meeting people, uh, you're going to come across people who unfortunately have cancer or have beaten the disease and are working through um, their new treatment. And that was kind of what led me into the, the communications realm when I was in college, when I declared that as my major, which to be honest, as a freshman, I didn't have one. I kind of just went to college because I was an athlete. I didn't really go for the scholars. Um, and by the end of my freshman year, my advisor said, okay, well, you have to, you have to choose a major if you want to continue to go here. So I had to, you know, pick something. And she said, you know, you really, you like talking, you're easy to talk to, you're already on a team. So like, why not communications? And at the time I was like, sure, whatever, if it gets me my degree, like, okay, whatever, let's go with it. Um, so I ended up studying interpersonal communications, which I think always kind of stuck with me because even through retail customer service and now into fitness, I've always been able to tap into the interpersonal connection and just making sure that I'm talking to a person and remembering that you're always just talking to people, meeting people, uh, and just over the course of the last over the last five, six years, I've, I've met people who are cancer survivors, and it's allowed me to learn more about 
what fitness is like there and, you know, how can I be a better trainer for my clients who may or may not have um, gone through that? Can you get, let me a little, let me know a little bit more about Ernest, your husband, and uh, you said he was a two-time cancer survivor. What are the two cancers that uh, he has survived? Uh, melanoma and he had kidney cancer. Um, fortunately, both were able to be removed through surgery. Um, but through that time, um, as a young black male, having to deal with a melanoma, you know, who, who do I talk to about this? Who, who can I go to to ask questions about what to do? Um, and then he met a very good man that he went to high school with named Johnny and Johnny connected him through his nonprofit that connects cancer survivors with people who have, um, been through treatment of the exact type of cancer. Um, so that blossomed into a, a beautiful friendship and more of a network. And, um, yeah, again, just remembering that cancer survivors are also people and, you know, always be able to have that as the, the grounding route to, um, how I explore and continue to be curious about the human body. Well, you know, a lot of people would think that a black male would never get skin cancer, but it's it's a myth. And it's really important that all people and all races are at risk uh, for skin cancer. And it is the number one malignancy in the human body mm -hmm. and needs to be treated with respect. Uh, I've suffered with four separate bouts of skin cancer, and uh, I'm kind of a poster child for that because of you know my fair skin. But people mm -hmm. think that black males are not a, have no risk, and that's not true. Right. at all and so you know your husband is a good example of that and so it's important that people understand that and kidney cancers are one of those really quiet ones that people don't even know about and they're more of them are diagnosed incidentally now than ever it used to be it was because of the triad in in healthcare we think of you know we we learn triads so it would be uh, flank pain, hematuria, and renal mass is how we make the diagnosis. Nowadays, it's we we scan patients so often with imaging studies that they're incidentally discovered, and many uh, renal masses are just followed. But when they get to a certain size, they may get biopsy then and or treated as your as your husband Ernest went through. Yeah. So it's a it's a great story that he's doing well, and another lesson to others. And you know, just because you're young doesn't mean you don't have risks. And it's important to stay on top of your health at every age along the way. Agreed. So, I thank you for sharing. Uh, Bruce, uh, I want to ask you a couple questions. Uh, I am a non-vegan poster child, even though I, I don't hang out at the parking lot at Burger King. Uh, I just want to know, how do you, how do you uh, give advice to people like me to slowly adapt to a healthier diet? That's a great question, and it's one of the most difficult things to do because I, I, you have to learn behavioral change, and that's hard, especially it's hard as you get older. Um, but I have learned there are two major motivations for major behavioral change. Number one is pain. The second one is a fear of an early death, <laughs> and uh, those will get you going. And I didn't have, suffer from pain, but I got the fear of an early death card dealt pretty, pretty quickly and pretty blatantly. And what I like to do to try to help people understand is, I, first of all, I, I don't like the term vegan because it, could, it tends to silo you into different types of uh, diets. Uh, you can be a vegan and ha eat a terrible diet. You can drink Coca-Cola and eat Skittles and potato chips and claim to be a vegan. But uh, what I like is the term that Dr. Campbell created, which is a whole food plant-based diet. And which basically means just try to make the majority of your food minimally processed plant foods with a lot of beans and legumes and uh, nuts and seeds and fruits and vegetables. And if you can do that, there's a massive body of good scientific evidence that indicates that you, it will probably, in all likelihood, help you live longer and avoid some, so many of the chronic diseases that put, especially us Americans, in early graves, uh, heart disease being one, so followed by cancer. And I, so I just use myself as an example. Um, it, it turned my life around and... I've helped several people do it. And it's just, it's so obvious if you look at the data that this is the best, the best way to eat if you can do it. If your well, goal is to live a long life and have a long health span. Yeah. 
Well, I, I, I used to use it as a joke that I still would like to eat a hot dog because they say it takes four minutes off your life. I figure the last four minutes, how good are they anyway? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that's not the perspective because it's eating all those hot dogs along your life that make that's you right. get to the end in a very poor fashion. And what you've alluded to is it's not just diet, it's lifestyle, it's behavior patterns, and it's really everything. And if there's one thing that we talk about is you know, proper sleep, proper eating habits, proper exercise, and you put them all together and you improve your lifestyle. And there's more than enough data that shows that by having a good lifestyle, which includes all those three things, you can reduce your risk for getting prostate cancer. You can reduce the risk for prostate cancer progression, and you can reduce your risk for dying from the disease. So all three aspects are beneficial and all the other aspects of your life can improve significantly along the way. And so I think it's really appreciative to have both you and Jeff here to share uh, these thoughts. Um, Jeff, I, I, I wanted to ask you a question of, you know, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is like along the way of becoming your healthiest self, which includes your fitness lifestyle, how, you know, when, what do you do when you're working with a cancer survivor and, and, and give them exercise opportunities? Well, so for me, it's always rooted in you're, you're working with the person and the human body as kind of the vessel, um, so to speak. And I, I have a client in Jersey who is finishing up her final round of, of chemotherapy. Um, and one thing that I hear coming out on the other side of this from cancer survivors is you come out with a new why. Why are you here? What is your purpose? Why do you get out of bed? And it could be everything from, you know, my kids. It could be because I'm going to live and be on this earth as long as I can. But you kind of come out the other side with a bit of a new why statement. And that starts your focus on what can I do for me now? Um, how can I continue to keep this body strong? Um, you have a bit of a new, I would say, pride with your body. You're appreciative. It's taking you through a lot. It's been through a lot and you're still standing. So it's good to come out and kind of reassess the why. Why am I here? Why do I get out of bed? What am I doing for myself um, day to day? And with that comes what I like to call the the joy effect. You got to find something that brings you joy. Um, so working with cancer patients, people who are finding their new why, establishing a bit of a new routine also in conjunction with what brings you joy. Um, and hopefully it's something dealing with movement. And that's where I would come into play. And as a personal trainer or anybody dealing with the human body, would be able to kind of put those two together. The goals you want to have based on Let's say your new why statement, you're you're coming out of this on the other side and you want to do something that brings you joy. I'm not going to waste time anymore. I'm not going to waste time doing things that are just obligatory. You know, I want to live life. Um, I, I had a bucket list. I'm going to continue to add to my bucket list and do things and see the world. And that's something you really want to lean into. And when you're working on your fitness journey, you got to do something that brings you joy because it's not easy work, um, especially for people who are coming through and have survived cancer. But for anybody, but it's it's not going to be easy work. You're not going to love it the whole time. Don't get me wrong. You know, people enjoy working out, but there are moments where you're like, "Gosh, why am I doing this again?" Like it's just you know, like you talked about Bruce, the pain that that pain effect. You know, we say no pain, no gain, but you know, you're actually working through a period of kind of intentionally breaking down the body in order to make it stronger. You know, as muscles grow, they get fatigued and we stress them out enough that they need to, to recover and rebuild. And that's why the muscles physically get bigger because we have worked them so hard that they need to recover. You got to kind of have that same feeling and momentum as you're working through your body, no matter what your, your um, style is, no matter what you consider to be fitness, as long as there's movement involved, as long as you create the habit and you stand firm and true to your why statement, I mean, I think that goes for anything you do, but definitely with, with fitness and going into a new journey, having survived cancer. I absolutely love your poignant message of finding joy in the journey of life, because I think a lot of people forget of the journey versus the destination. Mm. And they forget that this is really not a moment in time. You know, they, they say you only live once, you actually only die once, you live every day. Mm. I think <laughs> that people need to understand that. And need oh. to live that. And so I, I, I think you were spot on and I really appreciate that. Um, do you have a special approach that you take to uh, uh, clients that are you know, mentally struggling with their physical limitations? Um, so I, I, I always like to remind everyone that I work with when we talk about the word limitations, understanding that 
every every human on this planet has some form of limitation, uh, big or small. Um, but we're all working through something. I, I truly believe that all humans should be working through something. Um, and it may not necessarily be physical. It may be emotional, psychological. There's as humans, there's there's always something I believe that we should be working on for ourselves. You deserve it, and you should take the time to figure out what that looks like for you. But um, before you go anywhere, any kind of journey, you got to understand where you are. So everything should start with an assessment. Um, hundred percent. Anytime you're you're thinking about changing or going into the any journey, you want to start with an assessment because the assessment is going to give you the understanding of where you are, and that will show you the limitations. Again, every human has them. Maybe you can't put your arm, you know, all the way behind your back as good as maybe the next person. Um, I my body is biased towards more of an external rotation in my hips. Um, some people may know that as uh, being bow legged. Uh, but that's just my bias. And everybody has little things of they walk different or they move different. Everyone has that. Um, so understanding what your foundational assessment and your limitations will set you up to know, all right, where am I going? Because the issue is not the limitation. It's better to understand what it is. And then now we can move forward and decide what we're going to do about it. Maybe it takes a lot of time. We need patience. This could be a year to two year process. Um, it could be a limitation that the doctor says you cannot do, you have to follow that. And then you want to understand, well, what, what can I do doc? Like, let me know what can I do? Because I want to continue to make sure I'm, I'm seeking out every option for movement. Really. That's really the goal for everything. You got to put it to the, the root cause of it being just focused on what kind of movement do I want to do? Maybe I can't just slap on a pair of running shoes and, you know, go for a run, but can I do yoga? Um, can I swim? And I want to be clear when I say swim, I don't mean, like we're not going to hop in the pool and turn into Michael Phelps. Like that's not, it's not where we're going. Uh, but staying above water, are we floating? Can I just tread water? If I can just keep my body moving in this space. Um, and also looking into other options of maybe inviting other people in. Um, I work, I, I work with a registered dietitian because I'm not the food guy. I, I, I need someone that helps me with my own food relationship. Again, we're, I'm working on the vessel. It's not necessarily physical. It's not always about what can I push or how far can I jump or like how far can I run? Um, working on the body could be like being still, meditation, um, journaling. So instead of looking at the limitations as this is my hard stop, I can't go anywhere. Let's pivot and let's go to what we know we can do. Let's work through any kind of movement and take your time, explore, try things. Um, Go with people. If you need an accountability partner, if that kind of helps you stay in it, go with that. Um, yeah, just continue to always look for movement. Humans, we're dynamic individuals. Um, and if you're a cancer survivor, your body is strong and you're coming off the other side. You should feel proud of that. And you deserve to change things up and try different avenues of fitness. Um, again, movement is everywhere and there's always something the human body can do. It's a very resilient vessel. I truly believe it is. Um Really a wonder, but you got to give yourself that mental push to say, you know what, I'm going to continue to look for what I know I can do and continue to push um, past my limitations because they're, again, they're just the assessment. They're just telling me where I'm at. I am going to take charge and tell myself where I'm going. Um, and I, that's just kind of my stance on limitations for, you know, every person uh, in total, honestly. Well, your message is so clear uh, about the fact that people need to stop thinking about what they can't do and what they can do and look for the things that they can do. You know, we get uh, patients all the time that are significantly overweight, have mobility issues. And so something that we talk about, and I know Andrea has been you know, fairly instrumental in trying to find out what kind of chair exercises that we can get uh, people to do who are unable to really do much more than exercise within a chair setting. You know, it's really important to just find out what they can do and to just expand upon that to, to get people as much exercise as they can do, get more movement, more activity. Um, you know, more recently, they've uh, come up with a now uh, diagnosis called the sedentary death syndrome, uh, which occurs from people just from a lack of movement. And it's really important uh, that we try and find ways for people to move. On, on a regular basis and and really stay active. And so I, I really appreciate uh, some of these thoughts and we'll, we'll get into a little bit more in just a second. Um, I wanted to ask Bruce a question. Um, I wanted you to share a little bit uh, with us about your one day to wellness 
and I, I'm going to have you describe it a little bit. I'm trying to visualize you traveling in this van that's wrapped <laughs> in fruits and veggies. Um, yeah. I'm sure it got a lot of attention. Um, I think it's finally, I think the Wienermobile has finally met its match. Uh, I, I would love to see a, you know, a head-to-head -head competition between your van and the Wienermobile and see which one wins. Uh, but I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about One Day to Wellness, if you could. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we, my wife and I uh, started the nonprofit One Day to Wellness uh, about 10 years ago. And with the goal of providing good evidence-based information on fitness and uh, mind-body and on nutrition. And we partnered early on with Dr. Michael Greger. I don't know if you know him. He's pretty well known in the, in the world of nutrition. He wrote the book, um, How Not to Die, and How Not to Diet, and several other best-selling books. And he said, I'll help you out and support you, but uh, you can't take any money from the pharmaceutical industry the food industry or the supplement industry. And so we agreed to do that. And the reason being is because once you start heading down that avenue, you have to start thinking about your sponsorship responsibilities. So um, we set it up as a nonprofit just to help people understand evidence-based living and uh, a healthy lifestyle, which of course incorporates fitness. And um, for me, uh, uh, Jeff, you mentioned meditation. Uh, meditation has been such a powerful tool for me to deal with stress. Uh, uh, so I really am a big advocate for that and just any way you can get involved in that. And um, so that's what we do. We travel. Uh, COVID put a little bit of a uh, uh, damper on our travel schedule, but we travel all over the planet. We had a nine-hour certification. You can get it online now. And uh, it's really just all geared towards looking at what the evidence suggests and then seeing how we can change our behavior and move in the direct in that direction if that's what we're motivated to do. And uh, we also took, we teach cooking classes because it's easy to say, you need a plant-based diet, but if you're not, don't know how to do it and you haven't been involved, uh, it can be quite intimidating trying to make that transition in the kitchen. So we do cooking classes about once a month here in St. Augustine. And we provide free lectures and uh, we go to veg fest and just really basic lectures, again, focusing on the evidence uh, for plant-based nutrition, plant-based nutrition and overall health. So when you veg out, you really mean it then, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Got it. Well, we actually held an event uh, a few years ago. We called it just for the health of it. And it was all about uh, plant-based nutrition. And we, uh, we really tried to see if we can stimulate people to, to look at uh, fruits and vegetables to be a more integral part of their lives and to take some of the fear factor out and bring in some chefs to show how you can easily uh, you know, change the way you prepare food so it's not such a yeah. challenge, not so frightening or intimidating. And it can be delicious. It, I mean, it's a delicious way to eat. And I've done it both ways and I won't go back to the other way. So, Got it. Well, thank you. Uh, Jeff, um, we talked briefly about your husband, Ernest, uh, but tell me a little bit about why you founded Hustle with Heart. So Hustle with Heart was something I was kind of putting together when I was still in the hospitality world back in roughly 2015, 2016. Um, I knew that I always enjoy working with people. And at some point I wanted to be my own boss. Uh, and I always enjoyed thinking that no matter what I did uh, involving people, it was going to be something that had a bit of a hustle mentality to it, but I wanted to lead with heart um, kind of going against that design of dog eat dog world kind of entrepreneurship. Um, I wanted to kind of root this in exactly what it sounds like. Like I'm going to hustle, but I want to do it with heart. Um, so that was about 2015, 2016. I met my husband in October of 2019. And then we actually started the business, um, the former LSC we put together in 2021. And it was just us coming together, taking his HR leadership skills in my health and wellness field. And we combined it to become hustle hard. And we went through the process, got the LLC and it's a, um, a wellness and human uh, capital consulting firm uh, that again combines his HR leadership uh, with my fitness development and just gave us a space to work with the people we wanted to and become our own boss. And I was able to, you know, get clients and let that be the lead with how I run my business. Um, 
And then he had a client that he was doing HR work and I was uh, training their CEO. So we had like kind of that portion of working to create like a good work environment based on, you know, taking care of yourself first and then taking care of the people that work for you just kind of became what made Hustle With Heart a reality for us. Um, so yeah, it was just us becoming entrepreneurs and uh, we were newly married at the time. We actually started the business two months before we got married. Um, so it was kind of great to just work with my husband and, you know, us just have this together um, that will always be there because it's it's our LLC. So um yeah that's that's hustle with heart that's cool so um you know one of the things i know you do is heart rate based training uh, i know that's one of the things that you, you're really into how does that really work so the heart is a muscle it's also an organ but it's something that we can't physically train you know we do a bicep curl to, to grow our biceps so, you know how do you get your heart stronger so heart rate interval based training will allow you to work on exhausting and fatiguing the heart out uh, intentionally, you know, with strategy, very smart way to think about it um, and focuses on getting it up the right way at the speed we want it. And also more importantly than taking it up, how quickly can we recover? Um, I think that's typically what people always kind of forget. And they're always looking to do more, more, more versus how well can I um, strengthen my heart to recover nicely? Um, you know, can I come back into a, a nice, um, let's say 70% of your maximum heart rate um, in about 90 seconds. Do I need more time? Um, does it go up pretty quick? Um, do I, you know, giving us a moment to just kind of check in that. So uh, the Orange Theory, we use heart rate. Um, our OTB Connect actually tracks your heart rate during class um, so that throughout the workout, we're actually able to see where everyone is. I don't have to ask you, Dr. Lux, how are you feeling? I can look at your screen and see you're in the orange uh, or the red zone. And I can kind of assess where you are there. Um, because again, I can't see the heart and I want to know how you're feeling based on what's going on with your heart rate, not necessarily how your muscles feel. And a lot of people kind of, it's hard to say like, oh, I'm exhausted, but I don't understand why my heart rate is not as high as it is. Well, it's because your muscles and your body are doing more of the work and your heart rate's a little more balanced. So kind of teaching people to kind of understand their body in different ways, what I think is also just as important as learning to like jump high and run fast. Also be able to kind of just tell, all right, I can feel myself at about, you know, 60%, you know, for a nice light jog, you know, you want to be able to learn that about your body. Um, so having heart rate center blade training will allow you to just kind of tap into that a little bit um, to just kind of better understand the self and also work on having just good conditioning. You know, you we want to be able to walk up the steps and not be gassed at the top. Um, but if that's your journey, that's, you know, what we're working on, then perfect, you know, but we have to monitor that. If you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Um, and I think that's, that's very important, especially with the heart, because it's, it's, it's vital to life. Well, there's, it's always true. You don't know what you don't measure. And, uh, you know, people <laughs> always say, well, you know, how's that working out? Well, you don't know if you didn't measure it. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I get, I'm addicted to Orange Theory Fitness and to, uh, to heart rate based training. And I'm like, you can't get enough splat points in an hour. I mean, <laughs> You can, yeah, but you also got to make sure you got to remember, you gotta, how's your recovery as well? Like it's great to get up there, but you know, do you come down quickly as well? So both are both are great, but yeah, it's again, if it brings you joy, go for it. And so, what do you do with people with limited mobility uh, and heart rate based training? What are their options? Um, well, typically, you know, going back to what what are we able to do? Uh, limited mobility just means that there's just something we have to be a little more conscious and safe about. Um, gravity is a lot, you know, there's a lot that we can do that could get your heart rate up that entails you lying on your back. Uh, maybe we need to stay in a seated position and we can get our heart rate up as well. Um, you know, kind of just exploring what does get your heart rate up, you know, what kind of it gets you excited a little bit. Um, so I, I think some of that excitement, that joy kind of gets you just going just enough and then it starts to spark. And then based on what we're looking to explore here, we kind of fan the flames a little bit and get that heart rate up, um, in all different positions. Um, equipment is also another fantastic tool. Um, very much like going back to swimming a little bit. Um, if you're using floating devices, uh, but you want to stay in the water, but you can't tread water just yet. Get some floating devices. It's just the same as uh, a guy in the gym using a belt when he's squatting or um, wristbands to protect his hands when he's lifting heavy. So use tools. Feel free to bring anything that is a uh, a piece of exercise equipment that could kind of help you stay in a, 
I want to say artificial form of movement in order to kind of work through some of those limitations. Um, so tools and equipment are a great option to, to add a better value as well. If you just can't do the normal resistance or weight, like try some tools, resistance bands, um, go in and explain some of those tools and other options will help you find other avenues to work through the heart rate based training and get the heart rate up without necessarily needing to worry about, oh, I can't do this or I can't do that. There's just tools for a lot. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Jeff a question in a second, but um, I, I think what I'd like to do, Jeff, before I go on, is if if and when you're out with uh, with your husband and you're with a group of people, who's the one who speaks up most about advocating for health and tries to get other people to get healthy, stay healthy and get their checkups? How does that work out? Um, um, I would say both of us, but I, I have a little bit more leaning towards talking about the health and the fitness side of it. Uh, my husband will definitely speak up at any moment, especially in regards to, to cancer and that side of it as well. Um, but, you know, I think both of us know the value in taking care of the vessel, um, therapy, life coaching, um, massages. It's not always about, you know, you needing to do something. Sometimes you need to have a moment to just be still and let a professional do the movement for you. Um, I think both of us will always spark up the conversation and just talk about health, wellness, movement. Um, he's a big soul cycle guy. He loves soul cycle. So, you know, you get him talking about that. It's, it's all day. Um, yes, yeah, so I think both of us, depending on, you know, who's bringing it up and what exactly they want to know. Yeah. All right. Well, that's great. So that gets me uh, back to you, Bruce. Uh, and, and I, and I wanted to, to do this because I, I think that, you know, in a lot of times it's not just the individual who's the advocate, but their partner's a great advocate. And, um, so, so Bruce, I'd like to know, tell me a little bit about, um, why and how you and your wife are such, pro, you know, prostate cancer advocates. How did that, how did you decide to be an advocate and how did your wife decide to be an advocate as well? Well, I have to think about that question. Um, I think, well, my wife is in the fitness industry as well. She's, uh, um, she's invented quite a few fitness products, has invented quite a few fitness programs. And she actually convinced, I worked in Silicon Valley for most of my career in marketing and sales. And uh, about 20 years ago, she, she was always saying, come into business with me. I'm having a great time. She's a great motivator. Wonderful. Just like Jeff, you know, she, she can get people motivated to work out. And <clears throat> she finally convinced me to go into business with her. And um, it was most, it was really all fitness at that time. And I just started, I made a complete career transition into the fitness world and it was just a blast. I just, it was so much more fun than the corporate world. I was hooked on it. Difficult making money, but, <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun, but she's always been super positive and uh, just a big motivator and, and when I was diagnosed with cancer, I think, I don't know if she really read up on it, but she's just done a wonderful job of supporting me along the way and motivating me to help other people based on, you know, what I, the interventions I did with my own life. And so we still do that to this day. Yeah. Well, it's obvious. I mean, have a, have a spouse to write a book on the plant powered penis is not <laughs> something you see every day of the week. <laughs> no. What, what, made, what made her decide to write that? Um, she, because most people, but you probably understand this, but I, I'll say that uh, based on the evidence, erectile dysfunction is a foodborne illness. And just like uh, the vein chain, if you're having difficulty with blood flow, in your groin, chances are you're having other issues with blood flow, and it's, it could be just a canary in the coal mine, a symptom of a much larger problem. And so mm -hmm. um, she decided just to write a book to share her experience, because when I was first, after my surgery, my urologist said, you're going to have less sexual function. When I, and that was, I was 53, I'm 66 now. Uh, and then both rounds of radiation, so both uh, radiation oncologists basically told her your your husband's sexual function is really going to go away here probably in a couple years, and I it never did, and um, we have just been able to hold on. So it's a very motivational thing, you know. Sexual function is important, especially as you get older, 
And uh, I can honestly say that uh, diet just plays such a huge influence in blood flow, which results in better sexual function and makes you feel better too. Just like exercise. Yeah, exactly. You know, exercise is, yeah, I couldn't imagine not exercising. It's just, it's just such an integral part of both of our lives and always has been. So um, it's it, when, when you know how good you're feeling and you want to help other people get there, that's the challenge and that's what we try to do. And uh, give give people the tools. Uh, and so give people the tools. That's right. The, the, the behavioral change tools. Yeah. Yeah. Which which is that's always the toughest. You know. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like Jeff said. You just can't go and put somebody in the pool and have him become Michael Phelps, and you right. can't give somebody running shoes and expect them to go run a marathon. You that's know, exactly you, right. Everything yeah. is baby steps, but it's really to find the joy, which is what that's right. Jeff yeah. mentioned. You got to find what gives you joy, and you know, not everybody's going to find going out and running. 5, 10, 15, 20 miles gives them joy. It might just give <laughs> Not, them a pain. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. But it's, like you said, uh, Dr. Lutz, I mean, it's the synergy of all of that. So good mental health, um, fit, uh, consistent fitness, moving throughout the day, um, and good evidence-based nutrition will take you a long way, especially as a cancer patient. It, and it, uh, what I will say is a patient, you can – help empower other people to say it's not just in your your doctor's hands you you play a critical role in your own survival here and you can have a much bigger impact than maybe you ever realize uh, simply by changing some of your behavior to improve your health and once people get started if they can do it uh, and get started they start to feel better and then that just sort of becomes a, a rolling stone yeah. Well, well, you've really helped me segue to my final question, which is actually for both of you. And since I have Bruce already on the screen, I'm going to have you answer it first. And so the question is, is both of you really do live life with passion and commitment uh, to your partners, uh, to the people you serve, to the career that you've chosen. So what do you want to be your legacy? <laughs> well... Uh, if you're starting with me, let's see, uh, I would say someone that cared about helping other people and was selfless and, and tried to help other people. And more recently, I want to be known as a really good artist <laughs> because I started painting and uh, I'm having a great time with that. And I've got some paintings in a gallery. And so that that would be nice, too. But but most importantly, just someone that really helped other men, too. Uh, which I try to do whenever anyone reaches out to me, uh, it, just helping people in, in crisis and helping them through the crisis because you've been there um, is important to me. So that's a long-winded answer to saying someone who cared and is selfless. Yeah, it's a good story. It's a good good legacy. <laughs> Jeff? Um, wow, we went we went deep, Dr. Lux. That's a um, so <laughs> Um, I, I've actually been working through, so I, I am working with a life coach, um, to actually try to tackle that. Cause I'm not sh quite sure what my, uh, my new purpose and, um, really trying to identify my, my why in this world. And here and tonight, I'm, I'm kind of getting closer to the idea that I want my legacy to be about connecting people, um, and connecting within themselves um through the power of just movement like I'm, I'm really focused a lot more on just enjoying how the body's just able to get through so much beautiful movement and really appreciating that um and connecting people because i i don't have all the answers uh but i always commit to to anyone that i meet even if they're not a client but if i don't have the answer i will find someone who will and if they don't know then we'll find someone who knows someone that knows someone and, you know, we'll, we'll get them to the person that will know. And I find that to be one of the beautiful things that I love about the fitness industry. There's it's so dynamic and everyone here, Bruce, you know, this is, is there to help you be the best version of yourself. Uh, it, it, no matter what your, again, the assessment, no matter what's come out on the other side from this assessment. And I just want to be known that I was able to like help people connect people and just keep people moving. And no matter what you want to accomplish, just keep again, we're not being sedentary here. Um, we're here for a good time, not a long time. So let's keep moving. 
you know, having met both of you this evening and spoken with both of you this evening and heard your stories this evening, I think both of you are living your legacy. So you don't really have to share with us what you think your legacy is because you're actually living it every day. And I and I I can tell that right. right now. So I want to thank you. I, I just want to thank both of you for being here tonight. I think both of you have great stories, great mission, great purpose. And um, thank you for sharing with us and helping us be our healthier selves and I am hopeful that people will uh, watch this over and over again to pick up tidbits that will actually help change their lives because I'm certain that you have changed people's lives tonight. So thank you very much. Um, thank, we, you, uh, thank you, Dr. Lutz. Thank you, Dr. Lutz. Thank, thank you. you. Um, we at the MOU Men's Health Foundation want to thank all of you who are watching tonight for being a part of our prostate cancer care community. I hope that you'll join us during our events uh, for 2024. And just as a, a final reminder, International Men's Health Month is June, uh, kicked off on our Blue Monday Men's Health, which is June 10th, uh, Cogs and Kegs the same evening at Griffin Claw in Birmingham. And hopefully uh, Jeff and his, his husband, uh, Ernest, will join us because you're not too far away. And yeah, uh, maybe he'll, he'll join us. Uh, Bruce, sorry, it's a long way from Florida. <laughs> so it's a long ride, uh, but we'd love to have you. Uh, our mulligans for men, if you want to hit some golf balls and join us and celebrate uh, men's health and prostate cancer survivorship. And finally, our run for the ribbon at the Detroit Zoo on Father's Day, June 16th. Uh, also, we have a podcast on call for men's health for anybody who's interested. We have some really uh, great podcasts. Uh, our most recent one with Londi Maduro is a fantastic one. Uh, Bruce, you absolutely should listen to that one. Uh, okay. And I'm, I'm certain that uh, Ernest will really like that one. He'll find that pretty fascinating uh, okay. as well. And okay. stay tuned for our men's health event. Again, we want to thank all of our sponsors and partners, Lanthius, Dendrion, Blue Earth Diagnostics, Neil King Physical Therapy, and of course, the American Cancer Society. And one thing to remember, share your story and save a life. Uh, please feel free to do that. We would appreciate that. Um, we can uh, put the resource online on our website so that you can see exactly what we're looking for. And then uh, uh, Andrea will make it available so that you can actually send us uh, the video text and we can uh, publish it. So we really appreciate all of your support. I want to thank, again, our panelists and thank you for joining us this evening. And thank you so much and uh, have a great and safe and healthy year. Thank you, Dr. Lutz.